Okay. Um, as a director of the Public yeah, Policy so Center, of course, the policy <laughs> panel is going to be of great interest uh, to us. And uh, we have one of our frequent collaborators who's going to be moderating the session this afternoon, Senator Joe Volcom. Um, in addition to being State Senator, he's also Director of Outreach and Community Education, uh, Director at the University of Iowa Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research, and also works with IIHR and the Iowa Flood Center, and is very interested in these issues, and he was really one of the emphasis behind this whole uh, day today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. We're left with the hardcore. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to have everybody here. We've got a really good panel uh, who I'm going to introduce in a second. Um, now our focus is on the policy implications and future policy needs of the state and local governments as we address adaptation needs of Iowans. Um, this year was the fifth anniversary of the 2008 floods, um, and the University of Iowa commemorated that uh, with the College of Engineering, Hancher Auditorium, the Iowa Flood Center, uh, the College of Education, the C Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research, by working in seven communities and in, in hosting the Preservation Hall Jazz Band in free community concerts across the state. Also included STEM festivals and some community programs on, on flood recovery. Um, it's also the 20th anniversary of the 1993 floods, M amazing as that might be, the 100-year flood. Uh, and if you think back to the 100-year flood, I know I thought about it, Jesus, boy, this is a big flood, we're not going to see this again. Uh, and uh, Professor Swenson mentioned earlier the notion of crisis amnesia. Uh, what happened after 93 was crisis amnesia. There was not a lot of work that happened after 1993 that addressed the need to become more resilient. Uh, since 2008, the historic floods of 2008, the state government has been extraordinarily involved in recovery work, and I'm just going to cite a couple of quick things. We created the Rebuild Iowa office to handle recovery under General Dardis. The iJobs program that was created, more than $100 million of iJobs funding went to flood recovery projects, mostly public projects. Creation of the Iowa Flood Center. Uh, Director Scouten's going to talk about the flood mitigation funding some more this afternoon. The watershed management authorities. Then at the local level, we've had communities that go from protection of 100-year floodplains to 500-year floodplains. Tons of property acquisition has taken place, as well as the, a lot of flood protection going around public infrastructure. Our panel today is going to talk about state and local policy efforts. Um, we, did, we have invited, actually, uh, members from each of the legislative caucuses, and this afternoon we have uh, two of those represented, and uh, Representative Chuck Eisenhardt is going to be our first speaker. Um, he's, st he's standing in for Representative Dan Kelly. Representative Eisenhardt was first elected in 2008. Uh, he's, he represents the, mostly the city of Dubuque. Uh, he'll be followed by uh, State Senator Jack Hatch f f here in Des Moines. Um, Jack was first um, elected, uh, he was elected in 2010 to his third term in the Iowa Senate. He's coming to the end of the, that term. Jack's been a leader on health care issues in the Iowa General Assembly, uh, largely responsible for the fact that most, all, almost every kid in our state has health care. He graduated from Drake University in 1972 and is uh, the founder uh, of Hatch Development Group, a uh, real estate development uh, business here in Iowa. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Mark Scout, and you've heard from him already. Uh, just a couple things. Mark used to be the Sioux County attorney, if you didn't know that. He is also a graduate of Iowa State University and holds a, a law degree from the University of Iowa. Um, then we come down to uh, Mayor Frank County. We're pleased to have Mayor here. Mayor County was first elected at large to a city council seat in 2002. He was elected mayor in 2004, re-elected again in 2008. Uh, mayor County was selected to serve as pre President Obama's state, local, and tribal leaders task force on climate preparedness and resilience. Uh, he's been extremely involved with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, the Mayor's Innovation Project, um, um, among other things, and you can read more about all these people in their more extended bios. 
Uh, finally, Brenda Nations is the environmental coordinator from the City of Iowa City uh, since 2009. Her job focuses on environmental and sustainability issues facing Iowa City, and she's going to talk about some of their work here this afternoon. So with that, I would like to uh, have Representative Eisenhart come and share his thinking. Are you we're happy to stay right there? Here. Go forth right there. Thanks, Joe. My notes are here, so I'll stay here. If I stick to my notes, then uh, it will be shorter. Appreciate the invitation. Uh, what goes around comes around. Peter asked me to do this about a month ago, and I told him I couldn't because I needed to be in Dubuque, so I'm happy to fill in for my substitute, uh, Representative Kelly. Uh, he serves on my committee. I'm ranking member of environmental protection in the House, also on the Economic Development Appropriations Subcommittee, as well as a liaison to the Watershed Planning Advisory Council, along with Senator Bolcom. And I'd like to talk a little bit about this issue from our perspective in Dubuque. I'll try to avoid commenting on all the other topics that have come before. Uh, but with a focus on public policy, uh, we basically do, the way I summarize it, five things in, in state government, the legislature in particular. We pay for things, we subsidize them, we incentivize them, we tax them, or we regulate them. So if you're asking for public policy, it seems to me you're asking for one of those five things. Uh, in Dubuque, my first memory, social memory, outside of my experiences with my family was of the 1965 flood, which inundated our downtown. 1968, we used federal money to build the flood wall, which has protected our downtown, but it sent all the problems downstream, previous problems we had been experiencing. So with that in mind, I was very, felt very compelled, frankly, to vote the yes on the very first bill that came to the floor when I was elected in 2008, served in 2009, offered by Representative Tyler Olson to provide flood relief to the city of Cedar Rapids. You know, after all the assistance we had gotten in the past, how could I sit there and vote against helping other folks in their time of need? But since then, I've realized that what we do to prevent and mitigate is much more important, uh, frankly, than what we can and should be doing to uh, pay for in terms of reacting to the actual disasters. So in Dubuque, what we have done, frankly, is we've recognized the problem. Uh, we obviously can't evacuate our downtown, bulldoze it or replace everything, but we can control what's happening upstream. And we've had, despite our flood wall, six federally declared disasters since 1993. Uh, every one of them has impacted my district, flooding on a regular basis over 1,500 homes, uh, turning my, the, the streets I live on into rivers. Uh, and so the problems that those folks are, experience are, not brought, are experiencing are not brought on by the fact that they live in a floodplain. That makes them the victim. They're, what they're experiencing with more frequency is brought on by the fact is we're developing everything on the hill, paving it over, and forcing that water to go downhill rather than find ways to either retain it or, or infiltrate it where it falls. So City of Dubuque, you saw, got $98 million from the Flood Mitigation Board. That will offset several hundred million dollars in projects we have put in place by deciding to tax and regulate ourselves into the solutions we need to uh, devise to deal with this problem. Every household in Dubuque pays at least $60 a year in taxes. It's called a stormwater fee to pay for the improvements we're making. Uh, every develop, new development uh, in the hill and up, upstream in either the Catfish Creek watershed or the Little Maquoketa or Bee Branch watershed has to include stormwater retention as one of its features to, to uh, retain uh, any flooding uh, problems on site until time has a chance to dissipate it. And we retain that water in our new retention bases for as long as we can before putting it into the Mississippi River to send the problem downstream. So I don't think Dubuque is any more uh, interested in uh, taxing and taxes and regulation than any other community uh, in the state. I think what makes us different is the fact that we're willing to use our local control uh, levers uh, to basically make our own decisions and tax and regulate ourselves. This is not anything state imposed to do what we need to do to protect our communities. Other communities are doing this too. I serve on the Rivers and Waterways uh, Interim Committee, which met yesterday. City of Charles City, through the improvements they've made, can now retain and infiltrate a three-inch rainfall, and none of it will get into the Cedar River. 
uh, until that rainfall exceeds three uh, inches. Uh, I think the city of Cedar Rapids should probably thank the city of Charles City uh, for that. In fact, they may even want to pay them uh, for that because that's preventing flooding downstream. Uh, so policy issues, in addition to what we can do to enable local communities uh, to do the kind of things like the city of Dubuque is doing, uh, in 19, in, as part of the bill I voted on, and we all voted on here, 2008, uh, 2009, in response to 2008 flood, we created in the, our surface water protection statute, watershed management authorities. Those were referred to earlier. Uh, despite the fact that we call them authorities, they have no state endowed powers. Their authority is, I hope, that we'll put people on them and, and equip them with the knowledge and expertise they need to be authorities, i.e. experts at watershed issues. Uh, and then the cities, counties, soil and water conservation districts, we heard about them earlier, uh, can devolve their powers onto that authority to manage those issues within that specific watershed using, I hope, greater and greater resources that we as a state legislature can put specifically at their disposal. Unfortunately, we haven't done that yet. We need to do it. That's one of the policy recommendations uh, I'm suggesting. When we passed the flood mitigation statute, I had an amendment, it failed, that indicated that in order to uh, access these monies, you needed to have a watershed management authority in place. Had that been put in there, Lynn County could have put together, become part of, as an example, uh, an authority up and down the Cedar River and possibly could have used some of those funds to make improvements in Charles City, for example, through a watershed management authority. Instead, what we have is a situation is only those cities that can project significant sales tax revenues 20 years into the future have access to this. And I don't know if that's a real rational way for allocating resources. So the one last thing I would uh, suggest in terms of what we can do to keep this dialogue going, as our first speaker suggested, sustained dialogue critical for incorporating the latest advances in climate science into community planning policy and regulations. Then I'll give up the microphone to Senator Hatch. Uh, when we, a uh, new governor came on board, one of the things uh, we did as a state legislature, uh, by then I was not in the majority party, couldn't stop it. We basically repealed the Rebuild Iowa uh, Act and, and the office that created the, the Office of Rebuild Iowa, not thinking at the time that we were going to have to rebuild from something every year. When we did that, we also eliminated a very important uh, organization that we had put in place called the Climate Advisory Council. Uh, and I think one of the things we can do is take some of the leadership and expertise we have in this room, combine mm -hmm. it with many of the other uh, academics from around the state, not only in our regents' universities, but from our private universities as well, and create a new public-private pi partnership, a climate council that can fulfill this role going forward into the future and continue to be a, a permanent body, not only to engage the public, but to, to uh, facilitate the local efforts like the one I described in Dubuque, but also bring to us recommendations that we can deal with that are rooted in the realities Iowans are facing as much as possible uncontaminated by a lot of the political uh, issues that tend to prevent action uh, at the State House. So those are two or three things I'd focus on going forward, Senator Bolcom. Thank you. Good, good afternoon. Um, I, uh, one of the first points I wanted to make was that climate change is happening. Of course, you know this, but it came a little bit too real for me yesterday, and I was thinking of Pakazitsa and Bill Stowe, um, the former and present water works, or public works director for Des Moines, because I was in Washington, D.C., along with the mayor. Um, I was there... Monday and there was this pending snowstorm and I had meetings to go to and I was prepared was I could walk to them if it was really very difficult and I forgot that Washington's a little different and so I woke up in the morning and looked out and didn't see any snow and got ready and got down to the lobby and there the snow was beginning to fall and I got to my first meeting 
And actually, it was with uh, Secretary Vilsack. And, the, and, and I got there, and he said, well, the government shut down. And I said, really? And I looked out, and he and I laughed, made from Iowa. I said, is this what people think about with climate change, that there's a pending snowstorm in Washington, and they're afraid to even come to work when it's not even snowing? that it changes that much, that quickly, that they prepare not to show up for work. And so I, I, I sat there, and, and as we finished our meeting, the snow was still falling, but it was melting. I mean, it was not even accumulating. And, and the government was shut down. So I was walking out with Secretary Vilsack, and I said, uh, by the way, Mr. Secretary, who calls, who makes the call that the government sh is shut down? The president is in South Africa. Here, we know it's the superintendent. And that's a pretty tough call, to call school. But to shut down the federal government, who is that guy? And, and so Secretary Vilsack said, clearly not an Iowan. <laughs> so, by 1 o'clock, it was 44 degrees, and the sun was shining, and there was nobody on the street. I could get a taxi anywhere, so it was great. So that was the first point that, and we still are debating whether or not climate change is real, and those of you that are here know that it is, but that's a, still a political problem for us. And the more we understand it, the more we see the consequences, uh, the better off we'll be. Um, and then for us locally, obviously, Iowa is affected. We have, we have seen the effects of flooding in the summer and the spring. Um, we know how it affects us. I, I represent Des Moines. Um, Des Moines has been affected twice by the two latest floods. Um, 1993, uh, the waterworks were shut down. That was in my, uh, my district. And in um, 2008, um, we had flooding in Berlin and downtown. The, the sewer system couldn't handle it, so you know those, that was backing up, so we were affected there. Um, but it's not because I'm in an affected area that's important to me. It's because of what it does to the entire state. And, and now that I'm a candidate for governor, I'm looking at it beyond just my city or in Cedar Rapids where we have a business uh, project that was uh, it's a, an apartment building that we just built. Actually, we were the first apartment building that was built after the 2008 flood, and we built it right in the floodplain. Um, once we designed it that the first floor would be at the second level and the cars would be the only thing that would float away. The bankers and insurance agents thought it was fine, so they didn't care. But it was a discussion that was held in that city of why do we want to rebuild in the floodplain in a city? And they, they had to go through that, and it was sig significant the amount of public support to rebuild that city. I don't think people across the state understood how severe it was, and the discussions were real about actually identifying entire blocks that would no longer be built. And the city made, and, and the state government made support, had support to rebuild those neighborhoods and what it meant to that city. But for us, we understand that. But in rural Iowa, it's pretty significant. Um, I guess in, in, in looking and preparing for this, I found that just this year, last month, um, Joe, I don't know if it was your department or the, or the University of Iowa, but 155 scientists from 36 colleges and universities jointly called for action um, against global warming and asked the USDA to update its policies to better protect the land. And that's pretty significant, because before we were talking about protecting the infrastructure, protecting people. But now we have to really protect the land. And the extent of heavy rains in the spring in this state prevented over 900,000 acres were not planted because of heavy spring rains. And in my new line of work of running for governor, I'm constantly out in the, in the state, constantly looking at the, the, the uh, landscape and seeing pretty dramatic changes of, of, of land that's how it's plowed, you know, how it's planted, how it's harvested, and uh, what can be used and what can't be used. I'm looking at terraces that are being built and significant trenching going on for tiling. 
um, that has impact not only in for the land but for drinking water and how water and how that water is drained into streams and creeks and eventually into rivers where a lot of Iowans get their drinking water. So it has a major impact on how we live and I never really understood that to this extent that the climate is affecting everybody's life in this state. Um, and our failure to do something about any one flood or heavy rain affects it that much more the next time it happens. I was, I guess, um, in looking at, and again, preparing for this, um, and I think probably Joe, Senator Bocum was more involved in this, but we had, a, a, we established a, uh, an advisory council on climate change and they had a report that they issue, but I don't think we've done anything with that. Legislators and policymakers are not really taking this that seriously. And they need to understand that the effect of this is more important than um, looking, at, and looking at a budget and trying to reduce the role of government. We should be talking about how we can increase the protection of uh, Iowa commerce uh, for f against future flooding. And that's, that's a mindset that we're not embracing at all. I have, um, in kind of in conclusion, a couple of proposals um, that I would think we have to follow. And one is we need to continue to control, um, we need to continue flood uh, control planning uh, and projects through the DNR and in conjunction with the federal agencies. Uh, it is, it was pretty incredible talking to Secretary Vilsack just yesterday about how the USDA is redesigning the way it's approaching things because of climate change. You don't have to convince them that this is a new issue. This is a significant issue. They've known about it and they are trying to use their grants and their influence to states and local communities to start preparing for it. Um, we have to be pretty aggressive, more aggressive in the state. Um, we have to promote soil conservation practices at an unprecedented level um, and in cooperation, not with just the Iowa Department of, of Agricultural and Land Stewardship, um, but also with the federal government. One of the things Secretary Vilsack said to me a couple years ago um, when I visited him, he said if he knew when he was governor the number of programs available to states um, through the USDA to promote food, food production, but also soil conservation and flood protection. He said if he knew that his first year as governor, Iowa would have the best flood protection program in the country. There are resources out there. And states are not, re are not using them. This state is not embracing them. Um, there is this attitude that any money from government is bad money and we can do without it and that is just very narrow-sighted. So we need to really embrace the opportunities we have with the federal government and encourage business, industry, local government, uh, and our own state government to research the available resources available through the United States Public um, Department of Agriculture and other departments. And, and that leads to my, my third point of assist municipal wastewater treatment systems in addressing flood protection. Uh, we have done um, not an adequate job of helping local communities in their wastewater treatment facility or their drinking um, or their, their water quality uh, aspect because we just haven't felt that the investment would be worth it in the long run. And so when floods come and they sometimes hamper or even destroy the old wastewater treatment centers we have, then we begin to realize how, how expensive it is to wait. Um, the mayor will, will, will probably give you a much greater detail on the old system that cities have in how we take in water and how we, dis how we uh, dispense the wastewater in this city and older cities in this state. Um, it is an expensive deal and an expensive infrastructure that 
that we have to embrace uh, because it affects not only the quality of the water but the health as well. And then I think finally, um, one of the things that's really clear to me that uh, you can't talk about climate change at a state by state basis. Um, when I was in the legislature early in life, uh, my first tour when I was in the Iowa House of Representatives, I was part of a group that, that authored and worked through the 87 Groundwater Protection Act. And my, my contribution to that was working on underground storage tanks. And we actually, after three years of study and work, created a national model that literally eliminated uh, drinking water contamination due to point source in the state through uh, underground contamination of uh, leaking underground storage tanks. That was a statewide effort that we actually solved the problem. It was also the same bill that, that Paul Johnson, um, and he was one of our co-authors, changed the name of the Department of Agriculture. And that was pretty significant because he called it you know, Department of Agriculture, and then we added, and land stewardship. I can tell you that that took hours of debate during, in 1987, because at the time we talked about sustainable agriculture, they thought that meant organic farming. And organic farming was something that commercial industrial farming couldn't and did not want in their vocabulary. So it took us hours just to get that name change. That's how far we've come. But at the same time, we don't, still don't understand that unless we act as a region, as, unless we, we understand that what goes on in, in Minnesota and South Dakota and what goes on in Iowa affects Missouri and Kansas and Illinois, then we're not going to really solve this problem. And with climate change, things are going to happen so dramatically that it is almost unimaginable to think, but it is very possible that what we grow in Iowa today, 40 years from now, may be more difficult to grow. That we may think us a, of, of, a, um, of a state that grows corn and, and beans, but we may need to be thinking about growing other crops because our soil is different. And the research needed to keep the, uh, the agricultural economy growing is going to have to keep up with this climate change. Because if we really do have wet soil in the spring, our farmers are going to have to plant something different as opposed to letting their land go unproductive. Or we're going to have to be able to, s to really rotate our crops to save the soil because if we don't, we won't have that much later on. So this is an enormous opportunity for us to define the issues and to be imaginative on how we can solve this. But for anybody to think that this is not urgent is really sticking their heads in, in the sand. So this is not just an issue of flooding. It's an issue of prevention and an issue of growth for this state that we have to embrace. Thank you. My role on the panel is to uh, speak uh, to one policy item that has been enacted and is being implemented uh, as we speak, and that's Chapter 412 of the Iowa Code, uh, the Iowa Flood Mitigation Statute. It was passed by the General <coughs> Assembly, signed into law by the governor back in April of 2012. It establishes a 12-person board whose job is to authorize sales tax incremental financing to cities and counties that propose flood mitigation projects. It uh, deals with sales tax incremental financing. It's like uh, tax incremental financing, other projects or TIFs, but this one is financed by an increase in a city or county sales tax revenue over a base year. The projects are like those FEMA projects that have been funded in Iowa to the tune of $501 million uh, since 2008. But in this instance, the money is generated by enhanced sales tax revenues, and the conditions that are attached to it 
are much less stringent than FEMA attaches to its flood mitigation projects. And so with FEMA, they may have given $501 million, but the individual projects have been narrowed, they've been shorter in scope, and uh, uh, we think that uh, this new statute is going to, that additional freedom is really going to result in some better projects. So the board has authority to award a cumulative total of up to $30 million per year per applicant for 20 years, or a total of $600 million. No city or county that applies may expend more than 70% of its increased sales tax revenue, or $15 million per year, whichever is less. Uh, the board acted uh, back in December uh, five uh, to allocate to the city of uh, Cedar Rapids uh, $263 million over uh, 20 years, and uh, many of those years it will be allowed to use the maximum of $15 million per year. The flood mitigation increment funding may be up to 50% of the total project costs with the ballots being paid for by local and state matches. Uh, the board, as I said, awarded uh, 263, 264 million to Cedar Rapids, as the representative indicated, 98 uh, million to Dubuque, uh, 8 million to Iowa City, and 9 or 10 million to Coralville, 4 million to Storm Lake, and uh, uh, $5.6 million to the city of Waverly. Uh, these are not outright grants from the state of Iowa. That is, the, the ability of these cities actually to receive these amounts will be based on increased sales tax revenue over a base year. For these six cities, it's uh, 2013. Uh, rather than uh, taking those state sales tax revenues, passing them into the state general fund through the Iowa Department of Revenue. These amounts as generated by an individual city goes into their tax increment uh, account and then are used to fund annual amounts that they've requested in their uh, project. Uh, Two-thirds of the cities are using a combination of the tax increment financing and bonding. A third of the cities are kind of using a pay-as-you-go approach. They're taking in these tax incremental amounts. They're using them for the project as, the, as they have the money to pay for the project. And a couple of them are using a combination of bonding and pay-as-you-go. So far with these six cities, uh, $390 million have been allocated. That's 65% of the total of $600 million. Uh, that remains, allows $210 million still to be uh, distributed. Uh, three cities have indicated that they too will be interested uh, in those additional monies, uh, or rather two cities. and. Uh, uh, one water district, the Des Moines uh, Public Water District is interested. The city of Council Bluffs has indicated they'll be filing an application. And the city of Sol Sioux, uh, Cedar Falls has done the same. Uh, all the money, if uh, you probably noted, goes to the larger cities because those larger cities have the ability to generate the increment, the sales tax increment. Uh, we've had the city of uh, Winter Centers come in asking for money, but they don't have the ability to generate the in increment. A lot of the other small towns, I think, would be requesting money, too, if they had the capacity to generate the increment. The statute or the chapter provides for a flood mitigation fund that the legislature may appropriate money to. That money may be used uh, uh, to, to go to these smaller cities as grants or loans. As of today, uh, that side fund has not been appropriated or money has not been allocated to it. Senator Hogue is uh, one of the members of the uh, Flood Mitigation Board, and he indicated that that may be something that will happen during the next legislative session. 
where some amount of money may be allocated to that side fund so that grants can be made to uh, the smaller towns. Uh, so what's the impact on uh, flood mitigating, uh, uh, flood loss here in the state of Iowa? I think most people who uh, know the business think it will be uh, huge. It's a, uh, a significant amount of money, particularly when added to the federal and local matches if the uh, projects are built as uh, indicated in their applications. Uh, uh, some say that uh, flooding in those cities will uh, have a great chance that they'll all be alleviated. Uh, total uh, avoided damages uh, as computed by our office uh, could be as large as 1.8 billion dollars for those monies uh, expended uh, it's a significant program and I think over the next 20 years will make a, a huge difference in flooding in those cities Well, I'm, I'm Frank County and the mayor of the uh, city of Des Moines. I uh, came here today and have been quite fascinated uh, listening to the discussion around all these issues. Uh, I, uh, over the last number of months, uh, last quarter, quite frankly, of this year, I've uh, spent time uh, uh, in New York City talking to the United Nations about climate change and about uh, some of those effects at the United Nations. I've uh, been to Nantes, France and talked to uh, uh, the World Mayor's Conference. I was asked not to talk about that, so I won't talk about that. Uh, I uh, have been to Warsaw to the COP uh, talking about uh, the global discussions around this issue, which uh, are uh, frightening, fascinating, and uh, um, I walk away somewhat hopeful, but I was asked not to talk about that, so I won't talk about that. Um, I uh, last week was in uh, Miami talking to the uh, Caribbean countries, Central America, and Colombia in our work uh, with uh, national level folks and, and mayors and how we might work together to get some things, but I was asked to talk not about that, so I won't talk about that one either. Are you ever in Des Moines? Uh, occasionally, <laughs> um, and which is uh, part of the problem because these are very uh, short trips that you, you go on and I will, uh, weather related issues around flights, we could talk about that and I won't, uh, I won't today. But at any rate, um, I think what we're really here to think about and talk about is the extreme weather events uh, and what maybe the city of Des Moines has done about that and uh, what those um, uh, effects are of those events. And in Des Moines, certainly uh, uh, a heavy downpour, for instance, affects uh, flooding, it affects uh, water quality, it affects, uh, quite frankly, as I think about it, uh, now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a city kid, but my uh, uh, progenitors, my grandparents, my great-grandparents came off the farm. I remember my grandfather talking to me about the future of farming and, and everything that he did and how he uh, nurtured the earth and he built the soil and he's the steward for future generations and all the things that he was thinking about doing. And I think about that in contrast to some of the uh, uh, studies that we've thought about lately and we think about as uh, the, our elected officials uh, prior to me talked about the future of agriculture in the state of Iowa and uh, some of the, the things that we deal with in terms of water quality uh, uh, in the city of Des Moines and what happens and uh, as we think about uh, our future here in Iowa and I occasionally will say when asked uh, to uh, testify in, in Congress we'll talk about these effects and say I'm really worried about the future of agriculture in the state of Iowa. There are uh, uh, university research recently in the state of Iowa has told us that uh, over the last 40 years, we've eroded 50% of our topsoil in the state of Iowa. And 
on top of that, using our, our current, some of our current practices, although I know that some of them are getting better, and, and uh, I think I was told uh, not too long ago that we've reduced our uh, uh, erosion to uh, less than 5,000 pounds per acre per year of topsoil. Well, to me, and thinking of my grandfather, that's not really sustainable. What am I telling my grandkids and my great-grandkids if that's, if that's what we're, you know, thinking about? And uh, after I made that comment in uh, Congress, I had uh, one of the scientists came up and said, Mr. Mary, you ought to quit saying that because uh, really the numbers are somewhat different. Pre-settlement times in Iowa, we had about 18, 20 inches topsoil in the state of Iowa, and now we're down to six to eight. So what are we saying to future generations? We have to deal uh, with, with floods. We in the city of Des Moines have a uh, process uh, that we have worked through. I started a number of years ago on the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission, and we watched a lot of property get flooded, some parks get flooded, trailer parks get flooded. Uh, over along Four Mile Creek, a lot of residential properties getting flooded, and so what, what could we do about it? We established at that time sort of a moratorium in what we call the flood overlay district. We said we're not issuing any more building permits until we establish all the flood levels here. We can't just willy-nilly build every place. There are some places that maybe just shouldn't be built on. So we look at that, and uh, um, we continue to do that. Uh, we had buyouts after some of the flood uh, um, floods in the recent past, 2008, 2010. Um, we have gone into some of those areas and, and bought out homes that were uh, uh, devastated and over 50 percent of the value of their property uh, had been lost. And so we were able to buy them out through federal and state programs and, and some city monies. Um, we put pumps in around the city to uh, uh, behind levees and around levees. Uh, we've done it in downtown. We've done it down on the southeast side. We've done it up in Central Place. We've done it in Birdland. And we've also uh, uh, improved uh, our, our levees in and around the city. Um, there are some of the levees, by the way, were uh, being uh, challenge, shall we say, in the uh, periods of 2008 and 2010. Now keep in mind, in 2008, we had a significant flood here, much the same as we, they did in Cedar Rapids, although uh, that uh, uh, dump, shall we say, of, of uh, the, the cell that kind of ended up over the Cedar River uh, watershed was projected to dump in our watershed. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, we got a significant amount of rain, but certainly we didn't get that. Uh, it, it has challenged us to think about what if it would have uh, done that same thing here. Uh, we certainly were almost uh, inundated as it was, and, and you know, how are we going to deal with these things uh, moving forward? Um, as we think about our plan in the city of Des Moines, uh, it's sort of centered around A, prevention, and we work with uh, all of our, our city departments. We talk about what we can do, what we should do. Uh, we've talked about some of the things that we have done, but we have a plan that looks at prevention. We looked at, at mitigation because, you know, uh, during an event, as the water is rising and uh, houses are going underwater, we've got to save lives and we've got to protect property. That's our number one uh, uh, responsibility and uh, unlike some other places in the country when they have a snow event they shut down uh, city government can't shut down that's when we have to step up that's when we have to do uh, work that's when we have to go in the neighborhoods that's when we have to act and put all hands on deck immediately and oh by the way one of the things that I think that we in Iowa can be proud of I remember in in 2008 and 2010 when we were filling sandbags we had as many as 10,000 volunteers out filling sandbags and building up the levees around this city to protect property and protect lives and everybody uh, young and old and men and women of all nationalities rich and poor worked hand in hand together to try to make this happen and we had public sector, we had private sector, we had everybody uh, uh, working together on it. And I think that's one of the things that we can always count on in the state of Iowa. Uh, also, uh, is we're trying to figure out how to lessen the effects of that through a mitigation process and planning that, that we have when a flood event does it hit us. We also have to figure out exactly what resources we throw where and who can we depend on. So as we're thinking about policy moving forward, 
I think that we, we need to look at the state, we need to look at the feds, we need to quite frankly look at uh, our county um, uh, partners uh, in this, and in our case, Polk County and, and um, uh, some of our suburban neighbors. How do we look at our resources and see what our capacity is? Uh, what is it locally? What is it regionally? What is it statewide? And what can we draw on? I mean, sometimes the, those resources from a, a state um, pool would be uh, totally exhausted if uh, we had an event in Des Moines and we needed some response, but uh, they also had it in about 20, 30 other places around the state. Those resources have to be spent and you have to look at how you do it, but we have to try to figure out uh, what those priorities are and, and how we're going to do it. We also then have to figure out what we're going to do on our, the fourth piece on this after we've uh, looked at prevention, mitigation, and response. We have to figure out how we're going to recover and where do those um, resources come from. And uh, I think as we, we think about it, and uh, I, I talked about uh, quickly uh, in an area that I uh, was asked not to talk about, um, we look at it how we deal with issues, and we share uh, some of our best ideas, our best thoughts. We try to incorporate uh, science and technology. We try to figure out where the, the dollars are going to come from in the finance, and we share all of our best ideas with other people uh, in, in other cities around the country, in, in a mayor-to-mayor -mayor kind of a, of a level, and uh, that's kind of what I was doing down in Miami. We were sharing best ideas, best practices. We have to continue to do that sort of thing. We have to look at solutions that are significant. We, uh, especially in, you know, where do we spend our dollars and how do you spend them? And so whatever solutions we have, the solution that we present and work on has to be, have a significant effect on it. It has to be scalable. So if it, 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 it works a little bit in this particular situation, can we scale it up and can it be better? And then the other question, of course, uh, in, in all areas around, whether it's in the other areas in the state of Iowa, is it replicable? And uh, how fast can we do it? And uh, how much is it going to cost? We have to try to keep our, our expenses down where possible. So, um, you know, when you think about uh, um, where you spend dollars, and uh, we think about policy, we think about um, where we spend it. We have think we've got 947 plus or minus cities and towns in the state of Iowa. And if the solution is to build levees, uh, then how high do we build the levees in 947 different places? Because this isn't about some of the people, it's about all the people in the state of Iowa. And how is it that we can uh, work in the best interest of, of all of those folks? And as we think about it, uh, and we think about uh, the dollars that need to be spent, how do we do it? And do you deal with water? Is it best and most uh, effective dealing with it where it falls? Or do you stick it in a pipe and send it down river, which is sort of against the Golden River uh, rule of uh, water? which is don't do to anybody downstream what you don't want somebody upstream to do to you, uh, and figure out what a partnership looks like in uh, urban to urban areas, all of us working together, but there has to be a partnership and planning process and policy put in place where urban and rural work together, because quite frankly, we as Iowans, we're all in this together, and we have to think and plan for the future, not only for ourselves, but our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids. Thank you. Hello. I, uh, it's, I've never been the last speaker of the day, which is kind of interesting because uh, pretty much everything that I wanted to say has been touched on in almost every single talk. So I'm going to try and weave together uh, all those things and talk about how Iowa City has responded uh, to our floods and our disasters in the past. And hopefully in on a positive note and talk about um, the opportunities that these disasters have created and the changes that we've made to make our community a better place. So. Um, as Joe introduced me, I'm the environmental coordinator of the city, and I first started out five years ago doing our greenhouse gas inventory. We were the first city in the state of Iowa to complete that, and the time then, everything was about climate change and greenhouse gases, and 
lowering our emissions and then before you knew it the next thing was sustainability and we just came out with our sustainability assessment and looking at different indicators in Iowa City to best uh, know how to keep our city sustainable and then now we got everybody knowing what that means the new buzzword is resiliency and that's really kind of what I'm going to be talking about today and how we're dealing with um, our disasters and our extreme weather and um, Iowa City has had um, Two, the, as everybody has uh, mentioned before, the flood of 1993 and also the flood of 2008, and we almost flooded again this year. We've also had a tornado and straight, straight line winds. We've, we've been through it all lately. And, but what I'm gonna focus on today is the floods because that has had the most impact on city, city time, uh, city finances, and um, all the rest. So as everybody knows, we, we are a river city. Um, here's uh, beautiful Iowa City uh, bisected by the Iowa River. And we're settled um, it, by the river. Um, and it's a, it's a part of our daily lives. It's a really big part of our, our community. And most people see the river or pass across the river every day. So it is uh, usually uh, an, 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 an <laughs> it's a good thing for us. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, here you can see Iowa City, and somebody already said um, the university was started on the bluff, as you can see here, and then was later uh, the university owned, uh, owns now a lot of property down close by the river. And we had a false sense of security when, when the dam was, the Corville Dam was uh, built in the 1950s upstream about um, less than 10 miles from us. And I think we had the feeling that we would never flood. And you can see here the uh, water going over the spillway in 2008 as it did in 1993. And um, even though the dam does not keep us from flooding, it does give us a little warning. Unlike Cedar Rapids had in 2008, uh, we knew that a flood was going to hit and it was going to be a big one and we knew two days in advance. So we had a little time to do some preparation uh, and get ready uh, for the flood, which a lot of cities don't have the opportunity. So we worked closely with the Corps and uh, they told us uh, what, we were, what we were probably likely to experience. Uh, also mentioned already is that the university has had a lot of damage from the flood near uh, near the river, this is Hancher Auditorium that um, was damaged along with a lot of other um, buildings. Residential areas were affected and this is the neighborhood that was most affected. Um, and um, this area I'm gonna talk about a little bit later, but many of these homes were destroyed and um, we demolished about um, 100 homes in this area. This you probably recognize is the main entryway into Iowa City off of um, the interstate. Um, the river there on the right and Dubuque Street uh, totally underwater. Uh, and Mayflower is there, the building that's on the left. Um, this area we still haven't um, I've done all the uh, flood mitigation for yet and we're going to raise the Dubuque Street and um, also um, put in a new bridge there and that's still currently underway. Um, Melissa here is our, our engineer that's working on that so if you have any questions about uh, that project you can ask her but that's still in the works and still not finalized <coughs> here um, five years later. So uh, probably it's going to take I would say at least 10 years for us to recover from the flood of 2008. Another, our main city facility that uh, 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 had the most damage was our North Wastewater Treatment Plant, seen here um, pretty much totally underwater. And um, this uh, treatment plant was a dated plant, uh, and, but near the river. And so now, th now that we're replacing, we're gonna uh, demolish this plant, and now we're gonna have all the wa wastewater that's going to this plant go, go into our new to our existing south wastewater plant and our upgrade for that is going to be about 64 no sorry 46 million dollars so it's, as they were saying before uh, wastewater treatment plants can, can be expensive and we just recently received as um, has been stated before um, about eight and a half million dollars um, to replace this plant so um, 
that's good news. So after the flood, this is what we were left with. Um, it had flooded in 1993, and we did have a little bit of disaster amnesia. We did do a few things, but after the flood of 2008, we had to make these decisions as a city. Were we going to uh, do residential buyouts, and how many? Were we going to acquire some vacant land? We were going to were we going to elevate the roads and the bridges, uh, build a levee? What were we going to do with our wastewater treatment plant? And we also had to think about our um, uh, drinking water, our wells for, um, fortunately, we're on groundwater. Um, and we ha needed to raise some of those and, and uh, secure the doors. And what were we going to do about the University of Iowa buildings um, in the floodplain? So those were all decisions that we were faced with. We had to. Um, uh, decide what we were going to do with all of those, and that took some time and some, um, I think we made some good decisions um, that came out of that. Uh, the first was the buyouts. This was the neighborhood and that I showed you before. Um, the green in this area in the top map is the, is the uh, homes that were bought out. And so 100 homes were demolished. Um, also in the, in the map below, there were some homes that were demolished in that area. And uh, all that uh, had to go into our landfill, which um, created some problems of smell. It was a lot of um, wet, dirty waste. And the pink area in the map below is some cit city purchased land that they were going to, um, that after the flood, a developer wanted to develop that the city decided uh, to purchase. And it's a wooded wetland area that uh, there's not going to be in any development there. So that's just one of the properties that we purchased uh, for, um, uh, for wetland purposes. And the um, other land that is uh, in green above, uh, there will no be, be no more building there. This is one of the homes in the area, um, which the buyout, this was a million dollar home. So one of the uh, takeaways is that it's much better to have policies up front and to not build in these places because this end up, um, this neighborhood costs the city $22 million to, uh, for the buyouts, which makes for uh, very expensive parkland. So because we lost 100 houses, um, we got assist assistance to, um, assistance to build 141 new homes and that helped us um, that was for, from federal funds through a state program and this allowed us to uh, maintain our tax base this is again the park um, park road bridge that you saw earlier that's going to have to be rebuilt and you can see the debris we had to have a debris management plan for all of the debris from the flood and the bridge instead of acting as a bridge pretty much acted like a dam and just dammed up debris and in fact it had to be um, holes had to be drilled in it so it wouldn't uh, be totally destroyed um, this area where the blue arrow is pointing is our peninsula area and this we actually purchased in uh, the city purchased in 1993 instead of being developed um, we uh, didn't, we made it into a dog park in the Prairie area, and you can see in nine, 2008 it would have um, been flooded. You can see we give, gave the uh, river area to flood. Um, this is the wastewater treatment plant again that we got funding for, and we got a grant from EPA to, um, to do the planning. We're going to make it a new um, urban area that has wetlands and um, some uh, different parkland and open space. Another positive opportunity is their Berlin, Burlington Street Dam pro project, which is actually owned by the university that we're doing in collaboration. And we're going to um, uh, change the riverbank there and make that more uh, recreational, sort of like Charles City. And um, uh, we also opened in our new East Side Recycling Center, which has biocells and a lot of stormwater um, uh, management implementation that's there for citizens and a program that citywide that um, c residents and businesses can use uh, funds for and do similar things themselves. So in summary, um, what we learned is to think not if, but when it's going to flood, because with those flooding uh, so close together, we call it now the flood hazard zone. We don't talk about it as a 100-year or 500-year flood. And in planning in advance, we can certainly save money. Uh, we've carved hundreds of acres in the flood hazard zone. Uh, we've improved the land use and made um, 
making we're making more wetlands and sustainable development uh, we want to draw people back to the river um, and create recreational areas and uh, increase the uh, our citizens increase uh, awareness of waterways and stormwater runoff with our citizens um, one last thing is the city staff has been trained in the in the national instant man management system we have at least 150 uh, staff members trained for that and we're more regionally coordinated for uh, disasters like flooding and tornadoes and whatnot so um, i just want to thank steve long who's been doing a lot of this work on the and the flood and um, thank you again for inviting iowa city Thank you, panelists. It's now time for questions and discussion. Does anybody have a question? Chris, and then back here. Go ahead. If you, if Mark, I, can you repeat that question? Yes, the two? question is Thanks. under 412, is it limited to a particular city or can it be multi-jurisdictional? We have no multi-jurisdiction uh, applicants, but I believe through a 28 e agreement you can combine jurisdictions and actually add one or two political subdivisions together. Yes, good question. Can I ask, if, I'll ask you the question, and uh, we want to get it on the TV, uh, coverage of this. Uh, Senator, question to Senator Hatch, uh, what are your thoughts on the Resource Enhancement and Protection Act funding and on funding uh, the sales tax around the recent change in the state's constitution for conservation funding? Uh, the answer to the first one is, we started back in 1987. Uh, it was anticipated it would be fully funded shortly after it was enacted and it never has been. Um, as a result, we are behind in our conservation programs. Thus, we are behind in a whole variety of programs related to not only climate change, but good agricultural practices and food production. Um, and we need to, I think this year was the first year that we actually put a substantial amount of money in it. We have to recommit ourselves to that. and. We have a chance to do that. We have a surplus. It's a matter of priorities. And I think that our political leaders have been unable to put their arms around this. They still think that this is something you do with extra money. But funding REAP is something we do as a priority with everything else we do. It has to be part of our, of our uh, culture of uh, preservation and sustainability. Secondly, the we, you know, the, 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 the tax to um, um, the sales tax, the two thirds or three eighths. Um, there are so many different combinations for us to repeal a tax and add a new tax so we'll be able to get the three eighths funded. Senator Bolcom is, uh, is probably leading some of those, those discussions. And it's, it's really real in the legislature. We want to do that. It's something that we didn't. You know, we, we, clearly, we clearly know that the citizens of the state, by that vote, changing the Constitution, it's important. I don't know why the politicians are finding it difficult to live up to that and that, that commitment. It is the best vote you could take. And it's not just a poll of how people feel during a moment. It is an actual vote by the people of the state that they want us to put some money into it. I think that's the best way to do it. And, and we'll, we'll, we will have those discussions uh, during this next year. Um, on the card, a question for Mayor County and Brenda. Um, since land use decisions, uh, zoning, planning, flood plan development are made by local elected officials, 
what additional tools or assistance um, or powers do local governments need to, in making like, better decisions? Go ahead. <laughs> or do you have them all? Uh, yeah. yeah, right. Um, so, you know, the, the city of Des Moines is uh, in, I, I think, uh, hopefully we're doing it in, in a way that uh, we can lead uh, sort of by example. Um, I think we need to coordinate uh, sort of a, a vertical and a, a uh, horizontal uh, communication and uh, in, in terms of, of policy number one, but put policies in, in, in place that um, uh, somehow get dollars uh, to, to programs and, and, you know, we'd love it to be a grant but on the other hand, uh, maybe there's, there's funding mechanisms uh, that, that would be helpful in, in uh, getting some projects done. Uh, the city of Des Moines has done a lot of things that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we did it, at first uh, without uh, um, uh, FEMA uh, approval, but uh, the Corps of Engineers okayed it, especially some of the work on some of our levies. Uh, there ought to be some way to streamline policy uh, to get uh, certain things done. Often it, um, things that need to be approved at the federal level, um, you know, we've been waiting in some cases since 1993 on things that were passed uh, in, in Congress um, uh, that uh, um, never got funded. And so we had to like start over again and, and, and work on that. So we, we need to try to figure out how we have policy that uh, it gets enacted, gets funded from the federal level to the state level to the local level so we can get projects done that, that actually need to be done. Uh, I will say that the, fed, the feds uh, are helping somewhat, at least uh, from a visionary standpoint. Uh, we did a regional sustainability planning grant here. Uh, EPA uh, worked on a, a piece that they called uh, Greening America's Capitals, which was a greening of an infrastructure. We were one of the five states that was awarded and have uh, um, worked towards completion on that. Uh, we are working with the business sector to do a capital core uh, work. What do you do with the old buildings that uh, you know were divine, uh, designed uh, in the 19th and 20th century and they're still there? Maybe they're, they're part of the fabric so our community would like to save them, but they need to represent space that's usable in the 21st century. What has to happen? to make those, those green, if you will, and acceptable for uh, young professionals to say, that's a place I, I, I want to work and, and have a career. We also are doing the Four Mile Creek uh, Watershed Authority work, and maybe that can be part of, a, a, uh, uh, of an effort that uh, leads and shows uh, some of the policy and coordination efforts that have to happen between uh, urban and rural sectors to try to, to think about uh, water and flooding and that sort of thing. So uh, policies that enable us to, to uh, work together more fluidly and more easily and funding mechanisms I think would be helpful. Great. Thank you. Um, I would like to say that I think what would be helpful was it would be any anything that the state could do to help fund things before it floods, like fund uh, land use um, that could be put into wetlands or um, just to take out of the floodplain for development. So um, we've been fortunate to, to have federal, state, and local funding to do um, work after after the flood. But as as you see, we're trying to acquire land and to give the river a place to go. So anything that could, anything that could help cities uh, create ways to uh, prevent uh, flooding areas in the first place. Thanks. All the way in the back.
So we have a statement. I'm going to make it into a question for the panel. Um, have we missed an opportunity to tie rural and urban constituencies together uh, in our use of the flood mitigation funding, the sales tax funding, and the connection to that with engaging people in the, in the entire watershed in, in planning efforts? And the suggestion has been that we, Cedar Rapids, since they've gotten this money to build a levy, um, doesn't have sufficient uh, uh, reason now to participate, has not and may not now have sufficient reason to participate in, in a regional authority of uh, urban rural. Chuck, do you or Yeah, I can Mark? go first on that. The short answer is yes, and I think I mentioned that when I said my amendment to the bill was, was not adopted that would have specifically provided for that. Um, but even under the current statute on a voluntary basis, multiple jurisdictions up and down a river, cities, counties, and soil and water conservation districts can form a watershed management authority. Uh, and funds used within that and then the mitigation plan can say we're going to expend our funds through that authority up and down the watershed, not necessarily within the jurisdiction uh, of the applicant. So that opportunity is still there. It's simply not mandated, which I would have done. Uh, your second question is also interesting because uh, I wanted to comment a little bit on what came out of our study committee yesterday, our Rivers and Waters Study Committee. Probably one of the best outcomes you can hope for from a study committee, and that is we agreed to meet again, <laughs> <laughs> which is important because a lot of committees simply accept information and testimony and then adjourn without doing anything uh, about it or making recommendations. We were specifically empowered to look at what goals, priorities, projects, you know, measurements should be associated with a, a river program. Uh, and I think that's particularly uh, hopeful precisely because it gives us an opportunity as leaders, as rural and urban le elected leaders to come together around uh, a strategy to take a more holistic look uh, at what we're doing in water quality and quantity and f related issues. Specifically, uh, we've had a little bit of discussion today about the, uh, the nutrient reduction strategy. Secretary of Agriculture talked about it. I think even though he spoke before I showed up, I think Secretary Gipp probably did as well, Director Gipp. Um, that is very much focused on uh, agricultural aspect of those issues, specifically best management practices in field and edge of field. It really doesn't get into the water itself, much less look up and downstream uh, to look at, to, again, take that more holistic look. And as you suggested, that kind of tends to atomize the problem. Um, but I think through the, a river's strategy, um, we can kind of bring some breadth and depth to our overall water resources issues, of which the nutrient strategy is really just a piece important piece but still only a piece uh, and this interim committee gives us a chance as a legislature to really as urban and rural because those rivers connect our districts right um, Mississippi I live on the Mississippi so arguably I have a relationship with every legislator Republican and Democrat urban and rural up and down the Mississippi so talking about the river gives me a chance to exercise collective leadership with those folks. And I hope we don't miss that uh, opportunity when we reconvene in January. Any other comments on that question? Go ahead. I would just like to add to that. Since we were one of the cities that did receive uh, some of the funding to um, decommission our wastewater treatment plant and, and create that into a wetland, um, as a city, we're hoping to, I mentioned the Burlington Street Dam, we want that to be a recreational area, then downstream is the wetland, and then we also just opened a new big park, so we're really trying to improve our river along the city, but we're really, we're really needing to partner with other people as a watershed if we're going to have a re recreational area there, because um, we really want people to want to get in the water and, uh, and have good water quality in the Iowa River. So it's a good opportunity to do that. Right here. I'd like to first of all thank you for having this conference today. It's been Thanks. fantastic. So much of the discussion on climate change is oftentimes misrepresentation and distortion. Today we've heard scientific facts, and I, I tell you, I'm really proud to be an island. I've seen the scientific mind that you've seen today from the university telling us not only about climate change, but how we 
Thanks for the comment. Can I make a quick point on that? A quick point. Um, ironically, when we create boards, commissions, committees, councils, we think we have a right to ignore what they tell us as legislators. Because, hey, we create them. We can ignore them if we want. If we created a, recreated a climate advisory council as a nonprofit independent institution and we get the best minds around Iowa on that and they tell us what we think even though we haven't asked for it, it's harder for us to ignore you know, in, in a way. And so I've asked some of the folks who have participated in that previous council to put together a business plan, a prospectus of what it would look like if we created independent public-private partnership around uh, climate issues to do exactly what you talked about going forward. Who wants the final question? It's on the card. <laughs> We're going to give it away. Uh, briefly, Senator Hatch and Senator Eisenhart, do you have any? Do you have any future or current plans to implement any of the policy recommendations of the Iowa Climate Change Advisory Council, which had, I think, 56 recommendations, all focused on energy, energy efficiency, and that side of the, this discussion? Uh, good question, especially to uh, to a candidate. Um, when I uh, announced for governor. You know, it's just kind of a typical thing, who I am, what I want to do, and off I go, knocking on doors, raising money. We did something different. Um, we actually are producing uh, white papers, um, not a booklet that I could show and tell people, hey, just read my plan. It's in that book over there. Um, we're actually pushing them out uh, a couple every, uh, uh, every month, and we are going to be producing one on uh, clean water and clean energy. Um, an environmental sustainability proposal. And uh, we, we think good policy is good politics. And I'm sitting here with Senator Bochum and, and Representative Eisenhart who, who believe that as well. Um, but not everybody does. And so I'm actually betting my race for governor on something that most people will say in conventional wisdom can't be done. I'm going to engage the people of this state. And you have 58 proposed, uh, recommendations. I mentioned today that it was here and nobody was doing anything about it. Um, we are going to push those recommendations. I don't know which ones I'll end up supporting, but we will have a dialogue and we will be talking about it. And I'll be asking Iowans to engage in this conversation and to understand that we don't have to be afraid with the consequences of, of what we say. We just have to understand we're going to have to live with what we don't do. And so politicians really have to step up and understand that we have to do something that is positive. And as Chuck said, you know, we ignore these recommendations that, are, that we put in place. Uh, and, and we really have to be conscious about not doing that. The most successful opportunities we've had in the legislature that I've been involved with have been both health care reform and mental health redesign. We didn't start these last month or last year. These have been in progress for seven years. We've built a base of discussion and dialogue. And what happens? We actually have been pretty successful nationally known in both of those issues because we've kept the dialogue going. So we'll be, we are looking at, we have looked at uh, your proposals. We will be building some of them into our proposal. And we plan on, on challenging uh, voters, uh, stakeholders, and my colleagues in doing something about it. Two things I've learned from watching other people be parents. One was my own father who had this theory that um, keep asking people for what you want until they give you what you want just to get rid of you. 
Um, the other thing was from a parent of some young kids, I used to hang at their house watching sports on TV, and when it was time to go to bed, this is the difference between voluntary and optional, we talked about that earlier, uh, Mrs. Ott would say, uh, Allison, Andy, it's time to go to bed. Would you like to walk up yourself or would you like me to carry you? Um, and they were too young to realize that it wasn't an option. The option wasn't whether or not they were going to bed, but how. So I think as a legislature, you kind of got to treat us that way, say it's not optional that we deal with these recommendations, but how are we going to do it? <laughs> Uh, and when I came into the legislature, I was like 56th in seniority in my caucus. I'm now, I think, like 26th or 28th. The point of that is half of our caucus is new since those reports were initiated, um, and probably there's at least as many on the other side of the aisle. So most of us don't even know about what's in there. Uh, and the second report the group did, if I'm not mistaken, uh, never even got presented to us formally as a House of Representative, even in committee. I had to host a separate caucus, public caucus hearing to give Professor Schnorr and P Professor Tackley the chance to even present those recommendations. So I think if folks get together, uh, I'm on the Watershed Planning Advisory Council. That group is supposed to give us recommendations every year. We ignore those too. Uh, so my suggestion to the group when we meet is you don't need to come up with new recommendations every year. If they're still viable, give it to us again. Uh, and I think if we reform this committee, getting new people involved, simply take those old recommendations, give them to us again, make us give you what you want just to get rid of you. Oh. By the way, I don't say that to my constituents. <laughs> <laughs> I, I meant it, uh, although I wasn't asked to speak on this either. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I served as vice chair of this, this uh, particular advisory council, and I will tell you, and I talked to all of our legislators here, and I know that uh, uh, Senator Bolcom uh, uh, actively attended many, many of the meetings and uh, I think uh, tried to help us push some of these forward. But it was a little disheartening uh, after presenting it to the legislature and having it shelved that it has in 2008, by the way, that it hasn't been taken up again, that it sits there and gathers dust and ought to be taken back down. There's at least half of those uh, recommendations that were put in place that don't cost anything, as a matter of fact, are positive to, uh, to the economy and, and uh, would not uh, damage the budget whatsoever. Some, I will say, were fairly expensive. But in the meantime, uh, we have to talk about it. We have to look at mitigation policy. We have to look at what Iowans can do. And I know the general public, if we put it in front of them, is more than willing to take up at least half of these things. And this legislature ought to do the same thing, and they ought to do it this year. Good, Thanks. Good point. <laughs> please, please join me in thanking the panel. Nice job. So, Ed, Good. It's just, Ed, as our panel is dispersing, I just want to thank you all for spending the day here, being engaged, caring enough to spend the time and do this. Uh, I'd like to again thank our sponsors in addition to the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, uh, the EPSCOR, the Iowa Experimental Program to Stimulate Competitive Research, the University of Iowa Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research, IIHR, University of Iowa Hydro Science and Engineering, the University of Iowa School of Urban and Regional Planning, the Iowa Water Center at Iowa State University, Iowa State University Client Science Program, and once again the staff and students at the Public Policy Center, Leslie Gannon, Alex Sikulski, and the rest. Um, we will be putting, as I mentioned, UITV is filming all day. Uh, we will have all of this on our website if you want to use it. We'll be compiling some of the summary information. You can come and get it there. Uh, in next spring, we are also going to be doing a symposium on renewable energy, probably in May. So please look for that. Thank you again for attending. I appreciate it.